Counting down three, two, one. We are live. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Intelligent Disclosure. I'm Richard Dolan with my wife, Tracy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> we're a little late. We were supposed to Sorry start about that. six minutes ago. Uh, one of these days, we should actually you know, put out a recording of ourselves just before we go live every day, because I have a feeling for you know, some people that would be entertaining. We don't want to show that. We don't want to, but I'm just thinking <laughs> it would be it would be entertaining. So we're happy to be here with you uh, in, uh, what is this, week 96 of the COVID lockdown. It's something <laughs> like that. Feels like it that. It just keeps going. You know, uh, we're in New York State where it's even a little bit crazier than for, for some of you. And we're just, our thoughts are with everyone dealing with this lockdown, whatever your opinion about it. It's like, let us out. No, lock us in. It's like, no one can agree on this, but it's right. it's a difficult decision. You'd hate to be the one person like to make the decision. Like no matter mm -hmm. what is going on, like mm -hmm. you don't want to be that person mm -hmm. uh, because you realize that half the people will be angry with you no matter yeah. what you do or say. But uh, I am looking forward to this. This has got to wind down and we will have to start some kind of yeah attempt at recovery, but good luck with that. We got debt that's gonna be up the wazoo for the next uh, three or four lifetimes, my guess, but I know that's that. another one, that's yeah. another time. And on a totally different note, right? there was like a tiny bit of sun today. We get super excited because well, we just us. had nonstop rain. So tiny bit of sun and uh, if you'd seen this one earlier, I think people have no idea that their Richard Dolan is such a Renaissance man and he's running around Creating things outdoors, fixing up the basement. Building some shelves. Building some shelves. I got a little bit of paint still here. I, <laughs> I got the shelves done just like 30 minutes before we went on. That's the real reason we were late. But they're done. They're up. They're actually installed. They're on the wall. I'm happy. That's right. He's building us some uh, outdoor gardens. So the, the downstairs looks like a bit of a greenhouse. We're so. getting it together, man. We're trying. So we've Try got, <laughs> we've, we should jump in now. Is there, any, we want to jump into the UFO news and then we want to talk about Leonard strength. Oh yeah. There's huge news today. Uh, shall we go right into that? I just want to say this for everyone, all of the debunkers, all the skeptics who said those videos are fake. Yeah, sure. They're fake. And finally you get a little bit of, I mean, we actually knew that these were legit for a while. Right. You know, it's so like, this is not as big of a deal to the UFO family. No. Right. Because everyone like, knew. We knew, we knew, we've known for a long time, but to everybody else, it's a big deal. And to all of us, I think, you know, we need to do this. Take the win. Take the win. I, I actually, I'm a believer in that philosophy. Take the win because there's a lot of losses out there. There's a lot of checks in the L column, but we need a few W's. And with this one, you have a, a recognition by the Pentagon that those UFO videos that were released over two years ago, uh, through the, I'm just going to say the wily ways of Luis Elizondo. It's very clear that he was able in a semi, I'm going to say semi sneaky fashion to get those, those videos out. Yeah. Uh, the Pentagon was not happy about it. There was a lot of resistance. You could clearly see there was a bit of a power struggle or at least a bureaucracy struggle within the Pentagon, people supporting this, people not supporting this. And so you get a lot of misinformation that came out over the last few years about these videos, right. about everything else TTSA was promoting. But guess what? It's uh, it's legit. The videos are not only are they legit, but the real question, the real issue here is they're legit. Uh, is anyone going to be debunking David Fravor's testimony? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, or, you know, all the other folks who were involved in these, Kevin Day, all of these people involved in the Nimitz encounters have described an object that frankly is impossible and is not explainable by any current physics or science that we know of. Mm -hmm. And yet we've got this confirmation Now the Navy and the Pentagon didn't get into the, they didn't confirm the specifics of the performance, but listen, all you have to do is listen to Fravor. He's talking about this thing disappearing that's in right. two seconds right. where he had perfect visibility. You're talking conservatively, that's 10 miles. That's We're talking multiple thousands of miles per hour for this Tic Tac UFO. And it could be as fast as 50,000 miles per hour or more. Right. It's absurdly fast. Mm -hmm. And explain that people, <laughs> <laughs> how are you gonna explain this? So we're, 
you know, what we live in is a world of enforced fiction. We live in a world of enforced fictions all around. It's even beyond propaganda. It's a situation where you're not allowed or the people, the official establishment, people on NBC, CBS, all the majors, they are not allowed to speak the truth mm -hmm. about a lot of things. And mm -hmm. they are not allowed to speak the truth about UFOs. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, we live in a world of enforced fictions. BBC is just as bad. Don't think if you're an American, just because the Brits have a nice accent, don't think that their news is any better. Their news is often worse. So it's Western media. It's really global media, but certainly Western media. But here we go. We're in a situation now where there is a drip and it's a drip of disclosure. And I'm not saying it's going to happen this year. I don't know when it will happen, but we are, we are not in a static situation. I'm going to get into more of this in a detailed uh, video a little later this week. Mm -hmm. I'll probably record something a little more um, spontaneous and a little more in depth than mm -hmm. what we're going to do here. We planned on Stringfield. Mm -hmm. I think this is more than a drip, though. It just feels like a drip to us. But this yeah. is way more than a drip. This Maybe. is super significant. I mean, today was the first time that I went and did a search and every single mainstream media outlet has picked this up straight across the board. Major magazines, uh, all news outlets, just boom, straight across the board, everybody picked that up. Yeah. So, hmm. I mean, that tells us something. We haven't had that before. There was a little bit of a, a trickle and a rollout and everybody was starting to catch on slowly before, but now it's just boom, straight across the board. So we're in different times. We are, things are changing, but I'll, I'll just say this. Um, I'm not expecting this news on the uh, the Pentagon's announcement to last very long. We've had some very big bombshells relating to UFOs over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And all the TTSA haters out there, you just better suck it up and recognize that if it wasn't for that organization, none of this would be happening. None of this news would be out, like none. Uh, so love them or hate them, they are responsible for mm -hmm. the lion's share of this news that has come out. Even so, it, this is still an uphill battle. And yes, there are a few friendly voices in the major media, most notably Tucker Carlson over at Fox, not much else. But there are some people who are brave enough to be willing to talk about this in the public realm, but there's a lot that aren't. And mm -hmm. so, you know, those of us who believe in getting this information out and getting public recognition of the reality of this most phenomenal, important, uh, incredible thing, UFOs, we still have a lot of fighting ahead of us. It, I mean, yes, we're not in a static situation. So much has happened, but my God, mm -hmm. there's a long way to go still, in my opinion. Can I just, sometimes I think about what Lou Elizondo himself has gone through. You know, he came out with something that he felt so strongly about, and then he just has taken abuse nonstop. Yeah non-stop so this must be huge for him like a big big day big week for him it's funny so. thing i don't i don't know lou elizondo personally i don't, I, I, I don't either we have a but, lot of common people mm -hmm. and i've never spoken with him i really mm -hmm. ought to but i agree with you and i think uh it's been tough for all of those people uh i still laugh at the folks who say this is some kind of cia op they do not know what they are talking about they could not be more ignorant of the realities uh despite the fact that they're that yes, they have intelligence community connections, many or most of them, it's irrelevant. It's not an op, it's not that kind of op anyway. Uh, they may have their own agenda, but this is not a coordinated effort and anyone who argues it literally does, does not know what they're talking about. But more on that okay. next chapter. That's right, that'll be coming out later in the week. But we we're talking about Stringfield and uh, Stringfield, Leonard Stringfield is no longer with us. But, you know, what we were just talking about makes me think about him because can you imagine? I mean, he died in what, 1994? Yeah, 94. And uh, he probably expected this was going to happen over and over and over. He did, actually. Yeah. Right. And he a lot was, of people thought was, that with Jimmy Carter, this was going to happen. He was going to be the disclosure president. Right. So how many times people thought this was going to happen and they barely got any traction ever after all those years and decades. And here we sit today. And this is right across the board of mainstream news. It is. I want to correct. There's one person who put definite misinformation up on the chat. He's absolutely wrong. He said those videos were edited by TTSA. Wrong, 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 wrong. Why do you spout such nonsense? That's absolutely not true. Those videos were released 
in truncated form, not because TTSA edited them. What do you think you get off with these ridiculous statements? They were edited by Pentagon censors who are allowing only parts of those videos to be released. There's so much ignorant misinformation that is out there on this. And, you know, if you're going to say something, do a little bit of research and homework before you start trying to influence the rest of the, the public about this, because all you're doing is just spouting off wrong information. So, but back to string. Did you want to read that Harry Reid statement, that tweet? Oh, yeah. Do you yeah, want to do yeah, that? Yeah. I'm going to show this to folks. We're, a lot we're of jumping you, through this. Right. A lot of you probably saw this, but this was a tweet from former Senator Harry Reid. He said, I'm glad the Pentagon is finally releasing this footage, but it only scratches the surface of research and materials available. The U.S. needs to take a serious scientific look at this and any potential nas national security implications. The American people deserve to be informed. Yes, absolutely. And again, yeah. for people saying, oh, it's it's a threat. They're trying to scare the public. Like, get a life, man. The first two volumes of my UFOs and national security state focused on military encounters with UFOs. What do you think? Like, this is, I'm not saying the aliens are invading no one's saying that, but this is absolutely a phenomenon of objects that we don't know who, we don't know officially who they are. Uh, they're definitely not the Russians. They're not the Chinese. They're not U.S. black budget. These are not credible explanations when you go through the long history of this. So there's someone that's not us. So it's important. Mm -hmm. You know, when I did my two volumes of National Security State, and I got volume three in the sites, everyone, uh, I focused on the military encounters because I I realized that if you, I mean, the military encounters intrinsically are important. Like mm -hmm. they're, when you have jets scrambled to investigate these things, mm -hmm. that matters. Right. And that also leaves a military paper trail and you want to get that. And so for all of those reasons, but also just like you can see with TTSA, there's this there's this element where you just want to shake people by the shoulders and say, listen, pay attention. This is important. We don't know what is going on here, but this mm -hmm. demands our attention. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're dealing with a media and a world that's basically doesn't give a rat's ass about this and is just sleeping asleep at the wheel constantly, yes, you want to emphasize that potentially this could be serious. Like, wake up. And I think that's what they're doing. That's what I have been doing for all these years. It doesn't mean that I'm saying head for the hills, they're going to invade. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But it does mean pay attention. This is serious. So I think Harry Reid's statement that you just read is more of that. That's actually a very measured and a very intelligent statement mm -hmm. by a former member of the U.S. Senate. How many of those are you going to get on the matter of UFOs? So he actually made a very... Um, a very intelligent and a very well thought out statement. And I would say a brave statement on the UFO matter as well, when you get right down to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you found yeah, that one. Agreed. So shall we uh, move on to Mr. Stringfield? Yes, so um, we did uh, sort of a part one on Stringfield where we did a lot of background information. So if anybody's here and you wanna know more, we're, we're not really planning on going into all the background We could do a little bit. We can do a little bit, but we really, we really spent a lot of time with it throughout the duration of the entire show. And we released that, I think, just at the end of uh, 2019. If you're looking for it, I think it was in December. On Stringfield? On Stringfield. Yeah, it we've was, done a few it things was on called, him. Um, it. Was called, it had a picture of an alien body on it. I've seen I the bodies. I've seen the bodies. Yeah, yeah that that's, the, that's the name of the show. So I um, highly recommend that if you uh, like what you hear tonight and you want to know more. Um, and by the way, if we're going to just jump in. It's not easy doing the YouTube channel. If you really like what we're doing, hit the like button now, please. <laughs> Support us, smash the button, uh, subscribe to the channel, all of those things. Uh, it helps us get noticed in the algorithms, the YouTube algorithms. Help us out, please. By the way, Stringfield's a good segue from TTSA. And, and here's in my view anyway. Yeah, go ahead. If I have a beef against TTSA, which I've told them all of this, <laughs> it's like, you guys go through this little convenient fiction of, we don't know what these UFOs are. Mm -hmm. Collectively, they say this. And of course, mm -hmm. individually, they all, every one of them knows that there have been crash retrievals. I'm sure this is, I know I always, you always say that. And I always say, I'm sure they're saying what they can say. 
they have to roll it out that way. But I, I hear think that's you. right. Yeah, I think yeah. that's exactly right. I mean, they're playing a political game. Yeah. They've made this clear to me. They've made this clear to a lot of folks. They have to be careful. Although individually, a number of them, right. like Elizondo, have gone way out there and talked about crash retrievals. So right. they all know. Yeah. They all know that this phenomenon happens, but they go along with the enforced fiction of our society that it could be the Russians or it could be the Chinese, like stop already. But they do this because they feel they have no other choice. Mm -hmm. Well, it might be different now that this news came out. I mean, they really, that was has sort of a, I, I feel it had kind of a noose around their necks, you know, when they had this footage and it wasn't being confirmed by the Pentagon. So it was discrediting them. I will just say privately, uh, I've been told by members of that organization how frustrating it is for them to be uh, attempting to get the genuine information out there and being ignored by the media for the most part and of course being slammed by everyone in the UFO field who says it's not enough or it's wrong or it's disinfo. Like their, mm -hmm. their attitude is like, what the hell are we even bothering for? Like there's a lot of, yeah, yeah. there's a certain amount of wonder on their part, at least some of them about that. Anyway, uh, I've not been happy about the fact that they've been so tepid on crash retrievals, although I guess I understand but that's why we've gotten into Stringfield again. That's right. So I kind of wanted to ask you just to sort of do a review, who was Stringfield? Uh, you know, why should we look back at his work and why should we listen to him? So yeah. just to give everybody who didn't see the first one, you know, why are we looking back? For a lot of people, they want current, 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 but you have someone who really specialized in crash retrievals and that's what he you're did. about to get into, There's right? a nice uh, picture of Len Stringfield during the late seventies. This is. This is a book that you can find online. It's it's not cheap. It's like 80 bucks to get this it's on a big book. Amazon. I don't know if you can see There's, this here. It's um, a very big book though. Uh, but but it's it's invaluable for anyone interested in crash retrieval because it, it encapsulates all of Stringfield's so-called status reports. He did seven of them from the late seventies until his death in, er, in 1994. Uh, there's a lot in there, it's 350 pages eight and a half by 11. It's just basically all collected. The, this was not fancy publishing mm -hmm. back in the seventies and eighties and nineties. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have print on demand back then. He just did kind of low tech, but he put them all together. And there's the basic thing you were asking, you mentioned Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. back in the seventies, Jimmy Carter was running for president in 1976 and was the first ever presidential candidate who admitted that he had seen a UFO. And like, you think back on this, it's kind of an amazing thing at the time. Like the world was like, what? He admits it. Uh, and Carter handled it very well. Um, you know, he had a mainstream media establishment. He had David Rockefeller behind him, so they mm -hmm. weren't gonna touch him. Mm -hmm. But basically they treated him uh, very well, but he handled it well. And he said, look, we when I was governor of Georgia back in the 60s, we saw something, me and a group of people. And he never said it. he thought it was aliens, but he was very open about it. And so he was naturally asked as a candidate, if you are elected, will you release uh, the Project Blue Book UFO files, which at the time were not really publicly available? And Carter said, I will, assuming it doesn't impact national security. So there was this movement in, in 76, if you could call it a movement, among people interested in UFOs, that Jimmy Carter would be a disclosure president. Mm -hmm. They weren't using that word, but that's really what they thought. Uh, so there was a lot of buildup. And Stringfield, at the same time, was writing a book, which I don't have a picture of it here, but it's called Situation Red, The UFO Siege. We had it here last week. Okay. We had it around. And yeah. in that book, he, sp show. he spends a little bit toward the end talking about an interesting new potential crash retrieval case, the Kingman case, actually, uh, through the research of Ray Fowler at the time. And and that little passage got some attention and Stringfield did some local talks. He was in Cincinnati near Dayton, Ohio, near Air Force headquarters. Mm -hmm. He knew a lot of the Air Force people. He was ex-military himself. Mm -hmm. And he, well, he just started to get people coming to him. He actually was asking for people to come to him, mm -hmm. but he ended up getting way more than he expected. That's right. And yeah, he did that, uh, that sort of infamous conference. MUFON, 1978. MUFON, that's right. Right. And in Dayton, uh, Ohio. Yeah, where he spoke about crash retrievals of the third kind. And uh, Michael Schratt 
uh, who is a um, military and aerospace historian tells this story and I love it because at that conference, you know, there was a lot of drama that happened, but yes. uh, he had sort of put it out there, you know, uh, he wanted to have um, military sources and people come to him if they had had firsthand experience. We're talking July 78 here. That's right. And so he goes away on a vacation with his wife, Dell, yeah. uh, for a week or two, I'm not sure. And then they get back and they go to the post office, open up the post office box and there's nothing in there. And he looks again and there's this little tiny piece of paper and the paper says, you know, uh, see the postmaster. So they go to see the postmaster and these big guys come out with these huge bags. I think he had 6,000 pieces of mail that much. in, in response Lord. to uh, what he had said at that conference. So, uh, you know, he, so this is one of the reasons why he's a really interesting person to listen to. And he's attracting serious researchers because he did very credible research and always tried to get first hand information from these That's high right. level sources. Before we jump into this this case, which was deals with an interview with a live extraterrestrial, and we are gonna talk about it, so just hang on. <laughs> uh, I just wanna say one thing about Stringfield, and actually this is gonna come out when we talk about the case, but in general, and in fact, as a rule, Stringfield was ultra careful mm -hmm. with his sources. Yeah. Um, it's not like a lot of <laughs> folks today who have their whistleblowers, who are happy to give all kinds of information that none of which can be verified. Not only can the information not be verified, but they cannot be verified. Stringfield wasn't like this with his people. He was meticulously careful. And yeah. all you do is you read, you yeah. read the man. You can just see the kind of individual he was. He was, a, he was old school gentleman, yeah. but also an old school journalist mm -hmm. type of a man who was really believed in being careful. Um, now he was, careful about protecting anonymity of his yes. people. Yes. So that gave him a number of detractors in the UFO field, who, right. particularly Hynek, who string, I didn't mention this to you, but Stringfield and Alan Hynek knew each other quite well. And I don't really think Stringfield trusted Hynek. Um, a uh, lot of researchers you, at the well, time did not trust Alan You could Alan understand Hynek. that. I mean. Hynek was constantly probing Stringfield to get the names of mm -hmm. his witnesses. And Stringfield said, look, I'll give you information about the cases mm -hmm. and you give me some information that you get from your people, mm -hmm. but I can't give you names. And he said, Heineck was always a great diplomat and he, Heineck was a very nice guy actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Stringfield always suspected that Alan Heineck, like he never really knew if Heineck was still working for the air force mm -hmm. in the late seventies going into the eighties. So he that just, never knew. Uh, that goes to show how careful he was. Yeah. And whenever people talk about Stringfield, they always talk about his impeccable integrity. That's right. Impeccable that lasts to this day, even when, um, I, I believe, uh, some of are all 65 binders of his personal notes, his daily notes ended up at MUFON. His That's family right. has them as well, uh, but uh, his family does not want those records to be released to the public and MUFON well, is honoring that. They don't want the names. They don't want the names. Of the individuals. That's yeah. right. Stringfield had a personal secretary or assistant who also bequeathed uh, yeah. the records, all duplicates to MUFON, which right. Jan Harzan's got them now, but they've got the names. And so that's the, but it's an enormous amount of information. That's right. I mean, even more than what we've got in the that's right. status report. The family spoke to Jan, and you know, Mufon, of course, is honoring that. And uh, so they they will not be releasing all of those names. They will be keeping that uh, honoring those right. agreements. So it continues on. The thing you got to love about Stringfield is that he didn't try to be a guru like some people out there try to be. He didn't. He only was a researcher. And he never overreached. Mm -hmm. uh, and he took a lot of BS from other skeptics and other researchers, uh, even colleagues who gave him a hard time. But he, uh, I, it's always been one of my personal regrets that I never met Leonard Stringfield. Mm -hmm. He died just as I was really throwing yeah. myself into the UFO subject. And right. it's just the breaks is how it goes. And it doesn't seem like anybody's really taken over for that work. I mean, 
uh, for the work that he was doing. No one's yeah. really focusing in on that specifically. Everybody touches into it, except I will say Michael Schratt right. has uh, did a deep dive and got permission to go into those files at MUFON. Right. Uh, in, you know, as long as he still honored those agreements, which he did. Yes. But he came out with this amazing book, which is incredible right here. Retrievals of the Third Retrievals Kind. Retrievals of the Third Kind. And this is based on all of those files of Stringfields. Right. And uh, I'm not sure if you can still get this at MUFON, but I think I, I looked it up today and I couldn't find it. It's we'll Michael's, have, we'll Michael's such a great researcher. And he's like, yeah, the book's out there somewhere. But I we just want to just want to <laughs> say uh, for people who are into this, Michael has done all of these incredible pictures. You know, we hear these stories sometimes, but we don't get to see the pictures of what the cases right. uh, represent. But Michael took the trouble to go through and either do the artwork himself for all of these major cases, right. or he commissioned people to do them. Yeah. So this book is amazing. It's filled with right. all the cases and all of these incredible pictures. So I just want to give him a shout out because he's really into Stringfield's work. He'll be back uh, to be interviewed as well for the Richard Dolan show. Now let's dive into this case. Let's go. Okay. So this is about an interview with a live alien. Now Stringfield uh, wrote a piece for the MUFON Journal. I don't know if we have that. You've got that there. That's the October 92 MUFON journal. This is it right here. Uh, yep. Let me just show this to sure. folks. So if you've got a collection of the old journal, this might exist in a PDF form uh, online. October 92 is where he writes this article. Uh, and I'm going to share, we're going to share this with you. So what basically happened is that in the early 90s, Stringfield developed uh, several new contacts with individuals that he considered credible mm -hmm. sources of uh, not simply crash retrievals of UFOs, but actual um, who had stories of some type of interaction mm -hmm. with an alien being or alien body, but in one case, at least explicitly a live alien being. And that's mm -hmm. the one we're going to talk about here. Mm -hmm. So he um, had a contact who he described as a, uh, a physicist professor mm -hmm. of a major Midwestern university. And he never gave up the identity of that university, mm -hmm. uh, but he did say that they went back and forth for many months mm -hmm. developing a rapport, developing trust with each other before they were able to continue. Mm -hmm. And again, this is classic Stringfield. So, so this is a, a secondhand report, okay or third, I guess, for us. <laughs> but the professor, who again was a, a, a qualified physicist, that's what he taught, mm -hmm. had a close friend and colleague, a very close friend and colleague, who was a highly accomplished scientist, I think even more accomplished than this professor, mm -hmm. who had the experience with this alien being. So I'm going to read a little bit of the letter to Stringfield, and we have some very, very detailed quotes. Can I start with this one? Yeah, go for it. And you can it. take it. Yep. So the, the fellow says, Dear Len, this is in um, 1992. Here are the details of my friend's experience with a live EBE in the 70s. That is, EBE is extraterrestrial biological entity. I thought it best if I didn't say anything over the phone about my writing this letter. First of all, I trust this individual about as much as one can trust anyone to the extent that if he is lying to me, I really don't know who I can believe. He later said to Stringfield, he trusted this person as much as he trusted his mother. Mm -hmm. So he, same level of trust. This individual, he was asked by officials, either government or military, I don't know which, to meet with the extraterrestrial in order to attempt to communicate telepathically with it. I asked him where they keep it being, and he gave me a vague answer. And I think this is a typo here. He says, he gave me a vague answer that did tell me where, I think what they meant to say is that did not tell me where, otherwise it just doesn't really make any sense. Oh, well, actually what I thought he meant by this, I, I didn't think it was a typo, but I mean, who knows? He's saying he didn't tell him where he kept it, but he, he, figured he it was out. able to figure it out. Yeah. Well, if he figured it out, we don't know. No, we Because don't. that never came out. So we're left with uh, kind of an unclear statement here. Mm -hmm. um, but let's go through some of the, the key statements of this person to Stringfield. Um, 
So here we go. We're going to share this. Do you want to read this part? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me just He see. also said. Yeah. He also said that the military had devised some kind of electrostatic barrier for study of the limits of signal ranges at a specified location where dialogue took place. Yeah. So that's, that's really bizarre. Well, we wanted to figure out what an electrostatic uh, barrier uh, can be. <laughs> electrostatic now, barrier. Yeah. So we were looking into that this we morning. We did look. I, I did that one, that part. And I all I can say is that this seemed like you really wonder, is this legitimate at all? Like what is an electrostatic barrier? And I'm not going to pretend that I figured all of this out in one day. But it does appear to be something that can uh, affect biological organisms at the microscopic level. You can prevent or allow um, mo molecules both, I, I guess, organic and inorganic from activating and, or interacting in certain ways. So an electrostatic barrier can be implemented. Uh, one thing, and all of the research that I found on this is really quite recent. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't see much from the 1990s or 1980s, mm -hmm. but a barrier can be used as an antibacterial type of uh, uh, Technology. So uh, I read one uh, technology where an electrostatic barrier was in place in within a like a ventilation system to kill uh, bacteria. Sounds like a HEPA in a room. filter kind of thing. Maybe. But, I mean, maybe knows? that's it. So they were able to reduce eighty-eight percent of the bacteria. I think we need this. In a room. <laughs> uh, now I don't know if that's the reason that they had an electrostatic barrier here, but I. I can only wonder. Without no, you know, without going into what it actually is when we were looking into that, it just sound, it reminded me of, uh, you know, electric fences. Like you can't, you just, right. it's a barrier that you can't pass, but we right. don't know for sure what that was. So. All right. So let's just jump in. I'll read, I'll read these next two here. So he told me an interesting thing about the crystal communicator that the EB, he had there. He didn't see it himself, but spoke to someone who had seen it. And let me just do the next statement here. Apparently, each event that happens leaves behind some kind of biogravity trace, like the infrared trace we might leave for a few days if we walk across a field. So, so we read that and we were, you know, do we leave? <laughs> do we leave a trace the answer is in we infrared do. when we walk across a field? And yeah, uh, we... It, it seems that we do. So just in a little bit of research that I did, I found this. This is a, this is a study from uh, 2013. Uh, from, are you talking about this? Uh, yes, this the University here? of where I forget where I found it because it wasn't the only thing I was looking at today. Journal of Forensic Science is oh, okay. in the journal where this is published. University of Amsterdam, that's what okay. I was trying to think of. But uh, this was just without going into the whole study, you can see right here how... Uh, Th these are two different things, by the way. This is an article. This doesn't relate to this study, does it? I think that's a separate thing. Yes, it does relate to oh, this study. Okay, but it's good. just Thank basically you. an infrared imprint right. that we leave. So on the, I think it's on your left, that's a knife. And that's where someone uh -huh. had uh, touched it recently on right one there. side. So you could see the human imprint. Okay. And that's a seat right there where uh, there's still a remaining human infrared imprint. So we just were curious to know, you know, we just if this was based in reality. So it didn't take very long to find something like that. So, right. um, so there we go. I didn't know about a, a few days. That seemed like a, a much longer trace. And then the other thing was this crystal communicator that the EBE had. Uh, we don't, I don't want to get into that whole thing right now, but there is definitely a, in the lore, in the various types of alleged leaks, you do hear people talking about a device that these beings have supposedly had, uh, which could include a crystal on it. This is something that comes out in the uh, leaks every now and then. I think I've for myself, more here about wands or right. a stick as right. opposed to something called a crystal communicator. I don't think I've ever heard of that before, but. Well, let's just continue here. Uh, okay. Why don't you sure. read this part right here? Okay. So, according. Yeah, this is interesting. According to information given to my friend, this crystal device distinguishes between biomagnetic and biogravitational signals in the human brain's own crystalline field and can sort out biogravity traces from the past 
and can coordinate traces from specific events and show them in a Chris in the crystal. So that's a lot to sort of break apart. I was uh, when for myself right. when I did. Uh, it, it basically sounds like it's a translator of some sort and that it's going to be able to, uh, it, it shows a visual. This, so the question is, is how, like, do does the human brain have a biomagnetic and biogravitational biogravi signal? I don't, I didn't know that it would. Right. But I'm actually inclined to think it probably does. And the real question is, so can one be able to read or decipher such a signal? Uh, right. I mean, we, we've we developed technologies already here on this in this civilization that, you know, we've got spies who can read uh, vibrations on windows. Yes. And, and, and detect fringe and decipher. Anybody? Well, yeah. it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not just fringe. Like in real life, no, they, I know. they can it's do true. that. So, you know, to be able to decipher... These things. I just was reading an article by Israeli researchers. This is an RT, the only place you're going to get some genuine uh, news that you know actually means something. So they did an article on uh, Israeli scientists who have uh, the ability to uh, detect the vibrations from a fan inside a computer. Uh -huh. As long as they have certain software, and they you have to. You have to bug the computer. You have to put something inside the computer. But you can then read the vibrations of the fan. And supposedly, that allows them on a limited basis anyway to decipher the data in the computer. The fan's yeah, not connected. The fan's not connected to the data. So how that works is you got me. Uh, but that's a pretty abstract way of data extraction. But it just shows that there are these very sophisticated ways, potentially. So in this case, we've got this crystalline whatever that supposedly can read our bio, is it the biomagnetic well, gravita gravitational signals? Yeah, it's differentiating them, but it's basically what we wanted to know first off was, because this is saying that the human brain has its own crystalline field. So I was looking that up, trying to figure out, you, you know- You want to show them this article here now? Is this true? Yeah, so- This is the New York um, Times. I just want to say, I want to give a shout out to our members because um, they provided a couple links, wasn't able to get into all of them. But this is something that I found that was just in the New York Post, I think. New York Times. Uh, New York Times, Times. yeah. Um, so that was in 92. I can't see from here. Yeah, that was in 1992. But once you start digging into it, um, it's not so hard to find. So I found something else here. Um, Let's see, an intriguing claim that human brain cells possess crystals of a highly magnetic mineral known as magnetite, which is what uh, some one of our members was saying earlier. We just had to look into Members it. of our website. Members of our website. Right. Uh, thank you, Mark H. Uh, was described today by Dr. Joseph Kershevich, a professor at the California Institute of Technology. So he gets into it and he is... Uh, that's a, actually, this is that article. So this was a while ago, but he was suggesting that this uh, was something that we do have. And then a, there was a more recent article. I haven't had time to go through it, but it is looking like uh, this is this is something that is actually in the brain, this magnetite. Okay. So uh, that just gives credence to uh, what's being said here that, let's, let Good. me just read it again because According to information given by my friend, this crystal device. I'm going to um, I'm going to put that back up here. There we go. Let's just so people can read along here. I mean, you have to think about this crystal device distinguishes between biomagnetic right and biogravitational signals in right. the human brain's own crystalline field. So we're emitting these fields and can sort out biogravity traces from the past and co and can coordinate traces from specific events. And, and show them in the crystal. So it's like it tells you it's what like you've it's done, where you've been. It's a translator that creates visuals. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. It's, it is amazing. I so, mean, it's it's fantastic. It sounds totally sci-fi, sci-fantasy. But is it actually impossible? And maybe it's not impossible. Well, maybe they're, they're able to do it. Yeah, that's the thing. We had to look it up and see, are some of these things, is this feasible? Is some of it feasible? And, and it seems that some of it is right. so at least we can start from there but can we say this is 100 percent true right. who knows but All right, so that yeah. communication that we just read that that's the 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 bulk of uh the 
the letter, uh, the first letter that Stringfield received from yeah. this colleague of his. And uh, almost two years went by before they were able to reconnect and go even further with this, mm -hmm. where his colleague, his connection, his source was able to meet with the original source again. Mm -hmm. So in early uh, 1992, this is now about two years later, Stringfield gets another letter and we're gonna go through at least the description of yeah. the being itself. And uh, let's just let's just start here. We're gonna move right into it. So the guy writes to him, the extraterrestrial was insectoid in appearance and stood about four feet tall. And I think I'm just gonna jump right into the, some images here. So these actually were done by an artist to Stringfield. Uh, I think it was Stringfield who um, commissioned Wes, um, what does that say, Wes, can you read that? Wes Crumb. Crumb, yeah, thank you. That's right. And this um, is from Michael Schratt's book. I just want to add that. Stringfield had him in his work, but Michael Schratt, I think, did a nice cleanup of the drawings. Stringfield, by the way, in his uh, status reports, just wrote with these caption, how many aliens are being kept in deep freeze at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? Um, now, I don't know that this is an exact replica. It's, it's very close to the description that you're about to hear of... Uh, of what the being looked like. I don't know that this is quite insectoid, a little bit, I guess, with the eyes. Um, the eyes are described as a little more black wraparounds. Let me just read it. It has large black penetrating wraparound eyes that were both powerful and riveting. They seem to be 30 to 40 times stronger than ours, so it could see well at night and in dark environments. Its nose and mouth were insignificant. Its arms were long with respect to its body and its hand had four fingers, two of which seemed longer than the others. My contact could not determine its sex. I'm gonna back up and just show you that image again. You get a look at it. Um, I don't, this is not exclusively from the description of this individual. No, this it's is not, it's important uh, to say other, that. Yeah. Yeah. other descriptions that Stringfield was getting, but it's quite consistent. Uh, and indeed, we're gonna mention its clothing in a minute. It apparently was wearing clothing and you can see it's got some kind of clothing on here, so. And I think it's important to say that uh, sometimes uh, he would have people come forward and, and he would show the drawings and they would say, yeah, it wasn't quite like that. You know, they, right. they would do their best to describe it right, right. to him, but uh, I'm sure that, you know, you're trying to draw something that you've never seen before, you know, mm -hmm. so. So let's jump in. Why don't you take this part? Yeah, get right in where here. are we here? Uh, there, let's, it had some kind okay. of, can you, you see that? No. No. You gotta go back one page. Right here. Oh yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, it had some kind of head, uh, some kind of covering on its head, not a helmet, and also wore clothing, but my contact hardly noticed since its face was so powerful and riveting. He doesn't know if it had a belt line system on it. I don't know like what a that belt. is. Like a belt? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it didn't gesture or move. I think I remember this correctly. My contact did not notice any eye movement or blinking. It was too dark to tell if the skin was reptilian. It was cooperative and not hostile. Yeah, let's keep going here. All right. I'll, I'll pick this. This is the room was dimly lit with modest furniture and a single window. My contact was seated and it was standing. There was no one else in the room, but my contact thought he was probably being watched possibly through electronic or a paranormal surveillance. You want to just keep going yeah. here? Yeah. My contact would not say how he was brought in. And he would not say when their meeting occurred. He would only say that he has been cooperating with the government since 1973. Right. And so. uh, we'll just take it right on in. The extraterrestrial was not captured and there was no intercept mission. Yeah, this is, a, this is very interesting here. Yeah, going. yeah. Uh, rather, it was part of an exchange program. I think this is going to sound very familiar to a lot of people, but I'll just finish reading this and then we'll talk yeah, about it's that, like okay? Serpo, anyone? Right, but this is right, 1992. Right long before the Serpo story came out uh, officially, anyway, in 05, I think it was. So okay, so I'm gonna finish this and then yeah. we'll talk about that. Uh, so it was part of an exchange program. My contact would not say when the exchange took place. Their ship and others operates out of both East and West 
coast areas. My contact said that we benefited far more from the exchange program with the higher or ethical ETs than they did. It gets into that a little bit coming up, but do you want to just mention Serpo? Because I know, oh, yeah. I know we always say this, you know, we have a lot of people who are familiar with the subject and, you know, are veterans. They, they know this subject inside and out and we'll throw out, you know, project Serpo, this, that, but there's right. a lot of people, especially with the news who do not, who do not. So if you could just give us a little yeah. Serpo dose, we'll have to come into this in more detail in the future, I think, but Serpo is a, a story that came out, I think it was 2005, uh, through a series of leaks or, or uh, alleged leak statements that the material itself is very well written. It's very engaging. Uh, the uh, author, uh, the right researcher, Len Kasten, did a, a whole analysis of Serpo. You can read about it probably through his work. He does a very good synopsis of it. Uh, basically, it's a, a alleged story of a human ET exchange, astronaut exchange. And Serpo is the name that we gave to the alien planet where a number of astronauts went there and then came back. It's described as a desert world. Uh, it's actually, it's very interesting when it came out in 05, I think a lot of people were like, wow, this is quite an interesting story. That also had debunkers right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, my take on the Serpo story, I'm just gonna say, it reads a little too convenient uh, from my taste. Like if you were, Oh, you know, it just so happens that because it's a desert world, you don't have to describe any alien fauna or flora practically at all. It's like, it's very convenient. Like you would really, if you're going to go to an alien planet, you would think that there'd be more life there, but it's easy. It's, it makes it easier to describe mm -hmm. because there's nothing there. Like mm -hmm. you don't have to describe a whole world. Mm -hmm. So it's much less complex. Uh, maybe it is a desert world and maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's a true story, but I always had my doubts about it. Having said that, I have wondered um, if there is any truth to it. And the fact is, we don't know. There may be some truth to it. Uh, stranger things could have happened. I mean, I talked about a breakaway civilization, for goodness sake. So that's pretty strange, too. Is it possible that there could have been an exchange program? I would say, sure, it's possible. Sure, it's possible. There were just el elements of the Serpo story that I uh, was never really 100% comfortable with. But here you have... Stringfield's leak in 92, talking about an exchange. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty darned interesting, you got to admit. Let's mm -hmm. keep going here because we, we really want to get this done uh, efficiently, don't you think? So I'll, I'll just take this. Yeah, here. go for it. This, this is interesting too. You really want to pay attention here. Dialogue with the ET was normally behind some kind of electrostatic barrier, but the barrier and locks were useless since it could free itself anytime it wanted to. It chose to stay where we wanted it. I'm just gonna keep going here. Their mission here is scientific, not hostile. My contact communicated with it telepathically for roughly 35 minutes about various topics in astronomy and astrophysics. He couldn't, he wouldn't tell me what they told each other mentally, except that it came from a solar system so far away that it wasn't worth giving the location. It was not from Zeta Reticuli, the Zeta Reticuli star system much farther away. I think he mentioned Zeta Reticuli because that was always a, um, a suspected mm -hmm. place where these guys were from. And let's just take it right to the end here. My contact said that there are four different types of grays. Now this is interesting. Yeah, oh yeah. He had the impression that this one seemed to take energy from the surroundings rather than uh, through eating or absorption by photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. There are lower, that is unethical, and higher ethical ETs involved with genetic experimentation. I think this is the last, getting toward the end here. We're in trouble because uh, most experts cannot discern the intent of the lower ETs from the higher ETs who respect human freedom. All governments in the world originally kept everything quiet until they could find out what was going on. Then as more information was gotten and an agreement with the aliens was made, agreement with the aliens, mm -hmm. back to like, mm -hmm. these stories go back to John Lear in the 1980s. Um, it became harder to release the information and there could be a massive public outcry when this is exposed. Yeah, back in the 90s, people believed that they still had a democracy and a representative government. <laughs> uh, you know, seriously, forcing resignations on a grand scale, government, military, et cetera, 
New people will be needed to come forth with new ideas. Last thing he says here, my contact said the meeting was a powerful, riveting experience. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what Stringfield recounted in this letter. Mm -hmm. And they had a couple of his own thoughts on this. Um, you know, but in his own thoughts being that he, I think he believed his contact. He believed that there are multiple ET groups that are here. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had his own frustrations, by the way, with the, the charlatans and the, the loud mouths uh, and the hucksters of his day. Mm-hmm. Like it never stops. Like it never, never ends. Yeah, right. But his emphasis was always to do this as carefully as possible and to cultivate these people. And, you know, unfortunately, Stringfield was really toward the end of his life when he yeah. uh, had this contact. He didn't live much longer. Right. After by 94, he was gone. I know. So sad. that's the story. So, I mean, we, we don't have, like, to get a confirmation of this, um, it would help, you know, if move on. I mean, goodness gracious, you know, they're in a position where they've got to like redact the names in the files, but you really have to hope, move on if you're listening. Jan, I'm going to, we're going to have to ask him, keep a copy that doesn't get let out where those names are at least available because it, the day will come when this is important, where future researchers will want to be able to to yeah. check those names. Those people are all yeah. they're all passing away. Just they're they're all Jan going saying, away. Of course. <laughs> well, it needs to be done. Yeah. So... Now, what's this? You have something here? Uh, Well, okay. So when I originally found this, I was looking in this book and I wanted to go right to the end, his final epilogue while he, when he was looking back on his career. Stringfield? What's, yeah, Stringfield and what stood out the most to him. And that's how I found this case because Mm -hmm. he said this was something that had such a huge reaction when it came out in the MUFON journal. Uh, But one other thing, uh, I did find in there was uh, just a little what happened in the follow up. Go you for know? it. Okay, so here the follow up to that article in MUFON, the, the, which we just basically yeah recounted. everything we just went over. What happened after that? So here's just a little thing that he wrote in his epilogue, right at the very end of it. After months of silence, the scientist, through his longtime friend, a physicist who was my intermediary, said he liked my presentation at MUFON. Also, in trust, he allowed my friend to give me his identity. So he got his identity, okay? Uh, Which I recognized as a person in the scientific community. Remember I said I thought I had read that? He recognized the name. So it was implying- Of the original source, not just the professor, the actual guy. It was someone that he knew, like he- Recognize. So, uh, encouraged by this response, we expected more useful information to follow. But in early 1993, my friend called to relate that his source could no longer discuss the subject of UFOs because of certain sensitivities. So this and that was his final word. Fortunately, was his final word. Attempts to make contact continue with my physicist, physicist friend, but as of January 26, 1994, without success. Once again, I am reminded of many promising but inconclusive ventures into the UFO Hall of Mirrors, the abode of the surreal. He was such a good writer, and he died not long after that. I was going to say January 1994. He died in 94. Yeah, right? that was yeah. a year. So, so that was really the end for Stringfield. But he came in with a, a final, that, that final case was really quite fascinating indeed. And it's good to know, like, that name exists in the MUFON files. That's right. So that's that's another adventure, you know. Yeah. Going into getting that name, maintaining confidentiality, but it's an important name to know. Yeah. That that individual is probably not alive. I mean, it's been right. almost thirty years now. Uh, we have to assume, but that person has family and maybe has records. You never know. There could be leads there. Right. So fictional tale, disinformation. Right. I don't know. Um, when you really look into Stringfield, uh, you know, you tend to trust a lot of his high level sources. I, I, I do. Or trust I trust his judgment about them because yeah. of how he went about his research. Last thing, we should wrap this up. It is, uh, we're running into some competition oh. out there. It's oh, nine right. O'clock. Skinwalkers tonight. Just want to say this last thing about Stringfield. For Again, for the detractors, right, who said, well, maybe you're being disinfoed. You got people coming after you, just spewing nonsense to throw you off the trail. 
you've got to look at this in context. Uh, in the late <clears throat> late 70s, the, all of this happened for the first time, and it happened in a rush of enthusiasm by a yeah. lot of military people who really believed that Jimmy Carter was going to right. do a disclosure. Right, right, right. Uh, a lot of Stringfield's leads, the early ones especially, came as a result of that in the late 70s in the flush of Carter's election. Uh, some of the people were quite explicit. They're like, well, the president's probably going to mention something soon, so let yeah. me just tell you. So that was some of them. But then, you know, Stringfield, one of the great things about his cases, and there's so many, he almost always tells you how he came to the right. case. Right. So like a lot of it is these very circuitous ways that are like, you really would never, this would not be how you're getting full. Like he would have to work so hard for months and sometimes years on a case to get them to talk. Right. That's he could right. have easily given up many, many times and yep. you wouldn't have it. Uh, that's not how you give disinfo. Like you don't want to make it that hard. Right. And yet Stringfield, had to go through these various loops and leads of leads and leads like three or four leads in a row before right. he finally got what he was looking for. So uh, it's a, the, the stories of how he got mm -hmm. his contacts mm -hmm. are often almost as fascinating as what they had to say. I mentioned this last time too, not only was it that hard for him to get to them, but once he got the information, he would keep calling them over long periods of time to get their story. And, right. you know, of course he wanted them to eventually give up their names so he could have, you know, and he, so he would keep on them for that reason. But, you know, a lot of them, they just couldn't do that. But um, there right. was a very long-term approach to everything that he did. He must've had yeah. the ultimate patience. Yeah, I but, think so. Um, he did yeah. this for almost uh, 20 years, the last 20 years of his life. Yeah. Uh, what a service he did. And he he's not as well known as people like Stanton Friedman or Linda Moulton Howe or other researchers who've been out there a long time. But he's every bit as important, if not more. Like mm -hmm. Leonard Stringfield is arguably uh, one of the top two or three or four most important UFO researchers there have ever been. I mean, up there with mm -hmm. people like Kehoe mm -hmm. and Hynek for sure. I mean, there's Stringfield. He was critical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also the people who maybe pioneered abduction research, but Leonard Stringfield opened up the mm -hmm. whole study of crash retrievals of mm -hmm. UFOs. Mm -hmm. uh, not even Stan. It was really Stringfield who opened it up, mm -hmm. who made it mm -hmm. something that other people could look into. Yeah. So he's of fundamental importance. And I think it's really good for us to be diving into these Stringfield cases, uh, along with people like Michael Shred, who does amazing work on this. And, and there are others as well. But, you know, Stringfield needs to be understood. And I, I think it's good to bring these cases back to life. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important because yeah. I, I will admit, you know, I didn't know for a long time why he was so important, but th there is just amazing research here. And Michael Schratt was one to also say, you know, he had th this amazing close contact with the highest level people. I just want to read this list. Okay, this is from Michael Stringfield. Oh yeah, go for this it. This is, okay. And then, then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, these are just... I just want people to know these were the types of sources. This is a list. This is right out of Michael Schratt's book. Okay. Mm -hmm. Leonard's sources for the information contained in this book, in Michael's book, mm -hmm. include the following three star uh, Air Force generals, Air Force generals, Air Force fighter pilots, astronauts, commercial pilots, air traffic controllers, neurosurgeons, pathologists, theoretical physicists and mathematicians, U.S. Army officers, U.S. Navy officers, military police high-level Pentagon officials, top military brass, scientists, engineers who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So I just think it's really important for people right. to hear that. We're talking A-class. High-quality yeah. witnesses, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And with all of them, like none of them wanted to be involved in this. You know, none of them are looking for they, attention. None they wanted them. to go quietly with to him. Like they right. wanted to have the information, but they did not want they to They don't want to be involved. No. They don't want not to be involved in this, so. Yeah. Fascinating yeah. stuff. So, yeah. All right. So we are going to wrap We're going to wrap it up. It's an hour. Wow. We've done this for an hour. Can I just tell them one thing? Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> we have this little thing that we are doing. I think we mentioned it in our last uh, live show called RD Short Clips. Oh, right. Yeah. Short Clips. So what we're doing is we're taking a long show like this. And we've got some people helping us out and they're taking some clips that are usually 10 minutes or less. 
and they're going to take out some of the important information. We're going to pop it into a video. And so you can get nice bite yeah. size, uh, RD short clips. Let's face it. We all have the, the attention span of a dragonfly these days. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, we do an hour long thing, but sometimes 10 minutes is nice. And yeah. so, yeah, we've got a lot of really good longer clips. So, hey, if Rogan yeah. can do it, why can't we? That's right. Do little short clips, put them out it's there. It's like, who are men in black in 10 minutes? Who's Slender Man in seven minutes? Slender Who's, Man. Right. Nick Redfern. So, if you're wondering man. what those little videos are, you're going to see a lot of videos from the past, but we're going to start putting right on the thumbnail, we think, how long they are. They're all super short. So, yeah. you can get a quick dose of all the things that you were curious about that you've heard people in the UFO field talking about. So, Keep your eyes and ears peeled. Yes. And right. there will be a playlist you can look into as well. Right. I think we have the playlist already, don't we? Well, we might have the playlist, but expect to see some more soon. We, we our YouTube. I mean, thank goodness we have people helping us because otherwise we're just flying by the seat of our pants here. I know. But we do have Pursuing X. Thanks, yes, by the way, guys. Shout out to them. Shout yeah. out to our other uh, good people out there. We've yes. Got shout out to everybody who shows up. Chat for this. family. Uh, thank you to the chat family. Thank you to all the people. Welcome back to all the people who are usually here. See a lot of familiar and, names uh, up there. Yep. Welcome to all the new people for the show. Shout out to the members of our site, the people in the forum, and all of you. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, uh, subscribe and turn on notifications. And hit you, that like button. You will Smash then know it. every time we release a new video. Exactly. I shouldn't yep. have talked over you. You are totally right. <laughs> like, sure you would subscribe. Said notifications, all that good stuff. Go check out our site every now and then, uh, richardolanmembers.com. We have interesting things there as well. Uh, and that's it. That's, that's all it. we got. want to thank yeah. everyone for being here with us. It was a lot of fun. Really glad we got to do the dive into Springf Stringfield. And I think during this week, I will do a video on a little deeper uh, take on the uh, Pentagon's admission of the videos. It's huge. We'll do that. <laughs> Meanwhile, everyone stay safe. Oh, yeah, I and, see everyone. Uh, yep. And get out a hey, little guys. bit. Just do it safely. Don't get in trouble. Don't get sick. Don't get other people sick. And let's all stay happy, healthy, and sane. Let's do our best. All right. All later. Right. Good night, everyone. Bye -bye. It's great being here with you.